Hello, and welcome to the In 5D City of Angels Cosmic Awakening Preview Show on Sovereign Media. I'm your host, Helene Lipson, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Greg Prescott. Hi, Greg. Hi, Helene. How are you doing? I'm so good. I'm so glad you can join <laughs> me today here. Um, it's really exciting. We have five amazing guests that are all going to be at the City of Angels Cosmic Awakening Conference January 25th and 26th. Yes, we will. Greg, it's it's just a week away. It's pretty exciting. We're going to have an amazing time. <laughs> I know. My, my suitcase is already packed. <laughs> and I made so. I was trying on clothes today. I was getting myself ready. I was getting myself psyched. I was... um. I'm thinking about the party we're having, too, on the 25th. That's really, that's what's so fun about our conferences. We try to create a space where people who might have met on the Internet and other online forums, we create a space where people can actually meet and come together in the physical. And the people that are probably going to be attracted to this type of event are star seeds, awakened beings, way showers, light workers, light warriors, and so it's going to be a beautiful thing to come together with soul family. So, Greg, that's it. You hit the nail on the head right there. But a big party for soul family members, and I can't wait to go out there and greet and meet everybody. So uh, looking forward definitely to, to going, and gosh, we'll be there in less than a week from now. We're actually arriving there on Thursday night. Thursday afternoon. Actually, so am I. I'm going to get to L.A. Thursday yeah. afternoon, too. And I'm, you know what, so uh, come out and see us. This is at the LAX Holiday Inn in Los Angeles. And um, this is really why we're doing it. We really want to connect with our soul family and our friends out there that are like-minded, share our views. Our goal is to really create a 5D community. Which is amazing, Greg, because that's what you're all about. You're the founder of In5D. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I do. You know, that's one of my main goals on In5D is to bring together like-minded souls, star family members, and uh, soul groups, soul families. And that's what we're doing at these events. We had an amazing conference out there, well, out here in Sarasota for the uh, Return to Atlantis conference this past October. And looking forward to a, a kick-ass conference coming up in Los Angeles. I know. And the thing, that's, the thing about this one is they all are really just also a spiritual event. You know, one of our guests today is Dr. Dream, Mark Dr. Dream Peebler, and he's leading this huge ley line galactivation, which is also... Uh, you know, an actual multi-sensory approach using sound, using sight, uh, using visualization to help people call to them their soul family in, in an interactive meditative forum. And I think that is incredible. We had He did the same thing in Atlantis, and that was powerful enough to open a stargate. So, I mean, we're going to be we're going to be making magic. I wanted to add one more thing before we bring on our first guest, Greg. You know, for some people, I guess maybe Christmas hit them hard or maybe they're still stuck in the program of debt and times are tough. So please, if you are interested and you feel that you want to be here with us and you're in the L.A. area, drop us a line um, at in5theevent11 at gmail dot com because um we are we are we have created a sponsorship program and we would love to have you and we'd love to do whatever we can to get you to this conference if you feel that you belong there if you feel that you're called there we want you there so i just wanted to put that out there also for more in information about the conference itself, you can go to in5theevent.com to learn more about this amazing event. Greg, maybe you can tell our listeners about the speakers we have um, at the conference and then also who's on with us tonight. Well, actually, you know, tonight we have five of the six speakers for the City of Angels Cosmic Awakening Conference here with us. And uh, as a matter of fact, I believe uh, Laura Eisenhower is here right now with us. 
Hello, <laughs> yay. Hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. Hey, Greg. Hi, Helene. Great to be here. It was so great thank to you talk for, to you again. Thank you for oh, being here with us. Oh, absolutely. You're like my favorite people, so it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You're one of my favorite people, too, Laura. I mean, we had such a powerful time at Return to Atlantis, and I was so excited that you were going to be a speaker at this conference, too. There's something so magical about you, Laura. You just draw people to you that need to hear. I, I don't know how it is. It's just you have such a magnetic personality. You're such a great speaker, and you have such important information to share with people, and uh, and uh, like I said, we're blessed to have you with us. So this is going to be an interesting conference. This this round, what do you think that you're going to be presenting, or what are some of the things that you're going to be talking about? Well, the title is Reclaiming Our Divine Birthright and Shattering the Illusion of Separation. And it's really about understanding our galactic history from the perspective of our own personal inner work, our own um, connection to everything that's going on outside of us and how we can influence things that are going on outside of us based on you know, knowledge, activation of our wisdom, the understanding of our divine, you know, blueprint, and what we've been through as a species for so long so that we can begin to, you know, heal on the same sort of level that an individual heal, would heal if they were going through therapy or, you know, kind of going into um, some level of regression to really understand the roots of what has taken place up until now. And so it's a mixture of mythology, um, geology based on, you know, where the planets have gone, it connects with, you know, ancient history, even our galactic history. And um, it really just is about connecting the dots so that all the different systems of our being, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual energies can start to, you know, come together and be less fragmented and, and come into balance because balance is everything right now. And the main focus really is understanding the nature of the divine feminine and the masculine. And that's partly where the mytholo mythological stuff comes in and what the story has been from the beginning, framed in the fact that we're really in a profound love story, if we think about it. Mm. I'll tell you, with, with, with your knowledge of our galactic history, of all people, you'd probably be the best one to ask, isn't this all about the cycles of time and learning from what we've done in the past and being able to move forward from this point on in the future? Yeah, absolutely. And learning from the past is understanding, you know, the imprints that have still, you know, stuck with us, the things that have been passed down, we have ancestral um, patterns that have been passed down, but also archetypal and the cosmic battles, you know, that have been passed down to us. And a lot of false flags and agendas of mind control that have kind of taken us off track or very much so taken us, us off track. And so it's going back and understanding, you know, where we've been manipulated, but also understanding where we might have been enablers, where we may have been contracted to be a light worker or, you know, a major game changer, because really it's about the individual getting to know themselves enough to empower what they came here to work on, whether it's dealing with karmic imbalances or rectifying something that was done in the past or activating a mission or calling that has been somewhat dormant, you know, because it's not like we're raised to remember why we chose to be here. You know, we all have unique dispositions and there's a lot of diversity here right now. There's species from all over the cosmos and everybody you know, has their unique reason why they're here. But at the same time, we're, we're coming together in unity and, and we're recognizing that oneness is diversity and harmony. And the more we can stand strong in who we are and stand true to our role, the more we can connect the dots. And I use the tool of astrology as a really great way to help us understand our galactic history. You know, we, we had two planets that exploded that became the asteroid belt. So we have influences from all these fragmented aspects of who we are, you know, archetypes, and um, they need to come together and, and, and we need to create harmony amongst these different personality traits and these different characteristics that have, you know, some have been in opposition with each other. And the real focus is, is that we can work energy from the inside out. We can affect everything that's taken place in our history by understanding how to create harmony and unification within ourselves and amongst each other. And so understanding where there's been a lot of agendas that have been about conquer, you know, conquering and dividing us and creating a schism between our ability to really heal and regenerate and activate our DNA, you know, our huge focus is to overcome, you know, all that's been thrown at us. And so it's a lot about learning from the mistakes and also recognizing the errors of those that have been in control, but also to have compassion and love and help them to return to source 
through also understanding that there's been a lot of abuse, a lot of multi-generational abuse, and some very strong negative alien agendas that have been playing, you know, those that we might be wanting to point fingers at. And to just kind of get, take the higher road and, and really look at, you know, the real deal of what's going on and then call our attention back to what counts so that we can override and be senior to these lower forces. Mm -hmm. Now, Jumbo Melchizedek believes that we go through cycles. I think it might be like a 12 or 13,000 year cycle of divine masculine. Now that we're at the end of the divine masculine, we're seeing this all collapse and everything, and we're entering into the divine feminine. But eventually, it seems like, you know, when you get to the end of the divine feminine, you have this over-nurturing and starvation and stuff like that. Are we going to learn, finally, how to balance these these energies? Yeah, we need to because, I mean, the thing is with the time loop and the wheel of necessity, which is the zodiac, we're going to keep spinning in these cycles and repeating a lot of the same patterns if we don't really understand how to get into the center of the wheel, which is the zero-point energy. It's our unification. It's the balancing of the masculine and feminine because one shouldn't rule over the other. It's really about, you know, how these forces work together, what their properties are, and to engage them in a dance instead of a power struggle. Because once we're able to graduate from all these different lessons of duality, once we wake up from the mind controls and the tests that are being thrown at us, you know, tests about the strength of our human spirit, which is stronger than any of this, but when we identify with it, we can embody it and affect a lot of change. Once we do all that, then we're in a completely different territory, and we're much more the creator self. We're much more the manifester, and we're not dealing with the laws of these, these cycles, but the cycles will always be there for the souls that need to learn and grow and see the contrast that duality gives us. Well, mm, yeah. I, I actually have a question. I, I wanted to ask really about the energies in the here and now, Laura. It's been, you know, first of all, time, since we, we were ta you were talking about time before, time seems to be, I don't know, I'm thinking about the solstice, which the most recent solstice on the 21st of 2013, that was less than a month ago. It feels like six months ago. That's how, how long yeah. ago. And I also, you know, I'm noticing, too, there's been all of these programs that have yeah. been coming out and coming up. What are we headed for? What do you see as going on right now? Well, I don't see um, where predictions, and I'm not saying that you're asking this, we have been in an age of information, predictions, gaining knowledge so that we can step out of the tree of knowledge, the tree of good and evil, and say, okay, I get it now, thank you, let's move on. You know, so it's very easy to predict certain things. I mean, we know astrologically that we're dealing with Uranus-Pluto squares until 2015, we, you know, understand that we are in what's called a stellar activation cycle, even though there might be different information regarding it. It is a time of the natural stargates opening, and we are in alignment with the galactic plane, which provides us the activations that we need to really be empowered. And the cosmos and the astral planets are assisting us with this. But then the dark polarity of all those forces are at play as well, and they can yank us into an artificial timeline. And those agendas are very strongly at play so is our ability to liberate. And so it's very difficult to predict anything because we're all in probably the most important phase of our free will choices. And we're paying, you know, for the consequences of not making choices that are serving our highest self. And we're seeing an immediate kind of karmic backlash that's assisting us, but it can be very tumultuous for, for those that want to, you know, stay in the comfort zone or stick with what the old paradigm energies are all about. And so there's going to be a lot of upheaval there's a lot, you know, of agendas connected to transhumanism and artificial intelligence, you know, that are definitely a concern. But once, you know, a person finds their inner freedom and really does what it takes to unhook from the matrix, none of those things have much of an effect. I mean, we're dealing with the physical body, but we're also, you know, not able to be modified or tampered with on a soul and spiritual level. And so it's going to take a little bit of detachment from the physical and the survival element and the fear of any kind of death to pay attention to where it is that we're going to because consciousness can still move through the gates if the physical body doesn't make it. It's important to do our best to take care of the physical body, but when we pay attention more to, well, I mean, a balance of both, raising our frequency and being fully conscious in everything that we do, our words, our actions, our thoughts, our beliefs, the way we engage others, the way we conduct relationships, and we really pay attention to how to amp up our frequency based on feeling good and feeling clear and having a clear conscience and living by the laws of integrity, the physical tends to strengthen itself and it has an easier time transmuting any of the stuff getting thrown at us because it's a higher dimensional energy that we are embracing, which has different physics and laws than the third density matter. 
but the agenda seeks to keep us locked into the third density vibration of fear, reaction, um, you know, even addiction, and just all this different stuff, which makes it very easy to absorb toxins and to get really hooked into the artificial intelligence system um, that, you know, we're very vulnerable to. But we can be empowered. And I almost feel like I'm coming from the future sometimes um, because there's not any shred of doubt or fear or concern. I'm concerned always for those who suffer and are having a hard time, and that's why I do what I do. But it's like everything is really moving in the right direction. There's been a lot of hurdles and a lot of very challenging things to overcome, but the power of the human spirit is unstoppable. And as soon as people identify with that more than things like the negative ego and the anger and the blame and the shame, um, you know, the sky's the limit, really. And we're returning, you know, to the Sophia energy, the goddess energy, and on a feminine level, it's more androgynous. And it's not, you know, it's, it's about the balance. And what we're able to experience is being able to come and go from the physical as we please, having a lot more freedom to explore. But we've been quarantined in this 26,000-year cycle for the purposes of learning from good and evil, also to rehabilitate the souls that have created a lot of destruction in the time matrix in our early history. This is also for them. And so a lot of us have made huge sacrifices to put up with, you know, thousands and thousands of years of a dark age while they've had the chance to either, you know, transform and awaken or, you know, many have just continued to step up their agendas in, in, in even darker ways because they don't want to give up that power. So it's hard to predict because everybody's on a different timeline in a certain way, but a certain frequency and vibration is the organic ascension timeline. And it, it can be very diverse, but it's all about the heart and it's all about, you know, this certain level of expansion um, that, that absolutely removes us from, you know, these artificial replicas of the divine creation. Hmm. Wow, wow, well said. All timelines are fluid. It's hard to make predictions, I agree. And I liked hearing you say, the power of the human spirit is unstoppable. Because that was so empowering. I guess, do you have anything you can share with our listeners about how to stay on a high frequency? How, what they can do to stay, yeah, on a high frequency? Well, to know that reality is fluid and we don't have to constantly feel like we're at the mercy of everything that goes on in the news and everything that's coming out of, uh, you know, the, the shadow government and, and every attempt that it pulls to, you know, throw us down, it's, it's very important to create a safe container and to really, you know, have strong boundaries and to understand that we're dream generators. We can generate our dream into reality and be less affected by feeling defeat or fear based on what we're seeing around us. You know, what we're seeing around us is a temporary experience, and it's giving people exactly what they need, which is part of the unconditional love of the mother, to hold space, to allow herself to experience these afflictions so that we can see how the game is being played, so that we can see where we're still unconscious and asleep and what, you know, is being done. I mean, it's, it's all about revealing and exposing and truth, and the mother is a huge part of this. And so it's important to connect with the earth, to really connect with nature, because it's the core of this planet, the central star of this planet. And, um, you know, the central sun and the stargate into, you know, the energy matrix of spirit, that is the ascension. So the more we can identify this as the true reality, and not some just fluffy new agey thing, you know, and kind of drop all the projections and drop all, you know, the groups out there that are trying to, you know, control um, our beliefs through spiritual manipulation and we can feel, you know, that we're coming from our own essence and our own truth, recognizing that we've always been spiritual, whether we have the lingo or not, we're all spiritual beings, then we can start to awaken unconscious energy and when it becomes conscious, we, we discover that it's creative spiritual energy and creative spiritual energy affects change. It's, it's a part of the shift that we're in because the shift comes from the inside out. So the more empowered we are, the more we take care of our bodies, the more we understand that relationships, friendships, dropping the ones that, you know, are bringing us down and, and, and feeling empowered to just say no and, like, not worry about being mean about it, you know, because it's, it's just there's certain things that, you know, people get stuck in just out of, you know, misplaced loyalty, and um, you just got to be willing to cut away the stuff that, you know, needs to go if, if it's holding you down and holding you back. And also to explore earth medicines. I mean, I take essential oils. I've had symptoms that have made me, you know, wonder if I, you know, really – the effect of chemtrails and all this stuff, and I simply take oregano every once in a while and everything's clear, and, you know, there is medicine out there. There are solutions out there, and let's not wait around for disclosure from the government. Let's not wait for these power structures to enlighten. Their purpose is to try and control us. We can't really change them, but we can allow ourselves to recognize that it's us, the leadership of the human race, 
and us pooling our energies together and becoming unified that is going to override all these other things. I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't going to be good people that come into power, but we're the real power, and we don't want to wait for anybody else. We don't need permission to feel that we're ascending or that we have freedom. We don't need to see anything outside of us prove it to us. We have to own it on the inside, and we just have to keep plugging away at moving forward through whatever gets thrown at us, and we're going to find that we're going to come out the other side and look back and say, did I just bush through, bushwhack through that huge wilderness? Yes, I did. You know, maybe it's confusing and there's not a whole lot of direction sometimes, but the internal navigation system is the intuition, it's our spirituality, it's our integrity, it's our heart, and that's going to guide us. And everything else can match that vibration. We don't need to sink down to the lower vibrations anymore, and that's true leadership in this world today. You know, you, you were talking earlier about how consciousness can move through the gate. Maybe you can talk a little about our physical bodies. How important is it to eat right in preparation for our light bodies? Well, I think everybody's got a different sort of system. And it's kind of, you know, I take it on a day-by-day basis. Sometimes I have cravings for food I normally would never eat, and so I do it. And if it sits well, it's like, great. And if it doesn't, I'm like, okay. And, you know, people might be finding, like, instant reactions, more hypersensitivity to certain foods. I mean, we're dealing with geoengineering. We're dealing with, you know, problems with wheat and corn especially. And um, it's important to do your best to not have GMO foods, of course. It's important to have clean food, clean water, organic uh, vegetables and fruits, and uh, to, to, to make that extra effort um, and, and to have, you know, pure water, to use high-frequency essential oils to keep the vibration up, and to also not uh, pressure yourself to be perfect about it either because that can create, you know, a stressor which can be draining. I mean, the ultimate mm-hmm. vitamins and nutrients we get is from our own personal sun, which is our spirit energy. That's why people... There's breatharians and there's people that don't really need food and water, and it's not like we're going to do that overnight. But the whole point is, is when we're really aligned with spirit, we actually receive as much nutrients as we can get from, you know, the best kind of foods out there. And so, you know, if we're pressuring ourselves and if we get really stressed out about everything with chemtrails and what we're eating, it depletes us just as much as eating, you know, food that isn't good for us. We have to understand that mm-hmm. energy is like food, and um, the way we process energy can take up a lot of um, our vital essence. And so it's important to stay positive and to really just amplify joy to make as many positive choices about food as possible. But ultimately, the balance of joy in eating well has to be the priority instead of the pressure of eating well and the stress that comes along with it in the face of things that are making us feel like we're running out of options about eating. You know, it's like we got to make it work for us because the stress factor – connected with, oh, my God, I can't believe I just ate that, you know, my body's going to revolt or I'm not feeling well and just getting all panicked. It's just, you know, be empowered because self-love helps us to make good choices. It helps us to remove ourselves from addictions. The pressure we put on ourselves can make us easily fall off the wagon and go back to, you know, the Coca-Cola or the beer, you know, over-excessiveness. Mm-hmm. I mean, moderation is good. And even if we are over-excessive, sometimes if our light body is strong enough, we can transmute all sorts of, you know, negative things we put in our body. So we have to pay attention. Are we feeling vital? Are we feeling drained? If we're drained, we need better food. If we're feeling great, maybe we can get away with some things that aren't that great. But we have to pay attention. Listen mm-hmm. to the body. Listen to the symptoms. And listen yes. to your inner voice. And that's yes. probably yeah. I tell that to everybody. That listen to your body. I mean, when you have heartburn, your body is telling you that you're highly acidic and that you need to bump up your, your alkaline. So, you know, instead of taking like a Rolaids or a Pepsid AC, Grab a stick of celery, <laughs> you know? Yeah, definitely. And, and, yeah. And getting back to what you were saying, too, about, the, you know, yeah, we're all going to occasionally have maybe some pizza or something like that. And you know damn well that chances are there are probably GMO tomatoes in there. But if you put that energy before you eat that pizza, bless your food, talk to it, you know, and, and put that energy out there, you'll be okay. Everything in moderation. You know, none of us, not very many of us are, are exactly perfect or vegan or whatever, but – you know, just just put that energy into it. Listen, and more than ever, like like Laura said, listen to your body. Yeah, well, it's somewhat acclimating too. And if we cut ourselves off completely, you know, we we have to adjust a little bit to what's getting thrown at us because we're going to get exposed to it when we're on airplanes and on road trips, and we don't have the option to have good food. Um, the thing is, no matter what happens, no matter, no matter how many nanoparticles we're filled with, spirit and consciousness is more powerful than anything in the physical. And as long as we stay in connection with that, we can handle whatever the physical throws at us. Yeah, it's very, it, it, you know what, that was a really powerful point, too, because when we have shame about anything that we do, that actually hurts us more than the act itself. Yeah. You know, so that was, you know, we have to live 
enjoy light love and be as happy with ourselves and love e- ourselves every step of the way. Well, I'm yes. so glad, Laura, that you could could come on today. And um, how would people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about their work? Cosmic Gaia Sophia, C-O-S-M-I-C-G-A-I-A-S-O-P-H-I-A.com. And I have Laura Magdalene Eisenhower on Facebook. And um, Toroflove.com is Dr. Dream and I's website that has all our links and information about our newsletter. Wow, and what a, this is so nice, too, because um, we're going to say goodbye, Laura, but uh, we're bringing on Dr. Dream next, who is also going to be at the conference with us next weekend. So we can't wait to see you soon, and um, thank you again for coming on. Thank you so Thanks, much for Laura. having me, and I can't wait to see you guys. Okay, bye. 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 <laughs> bye. You brought up the topic of uh, earth energies, and, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, a lot of people are feeling these different energies coming in. In your opinion, where are they coming from? Is it the galactic center? Is it Alcyon? Is it from the solar flares or coronal mass ejections? Is it something else? To me, I was thinking that it was the solar flares, especially the day that we had that huge uh, solar flare um, thing that was, you know, the solar flare is like lighting up all these dark pieces, all these shadows that are within us, all these packets of enslaved energy that are hiding, and they were all coming out. Uh, that's, you know, for us to see, for us to process, and for us to release and send to the central sun. But it has definitely been, um, it's been a lot of ups and downs, but I do feel like since maybe Wednesday the 15th, I feel like uh, the energy settled down a bit. What do you think, Greg? I think it's, I think it's a little of everything, honestly, um, because I, I do think that ultimately uh, there's a major energy source coming from the galactic center. As a matter of fact, they proved that there's this huge bubble coming out of both ends that's just expanding and growing bigger, and that's got to do something in a, in a positive way, in my opinion. But it could also be it could also be something with Alcyon. You know, they say that we're not in a binary system, but just about every solar system has a binary star. Now, some people might think it's Nibiru, but I think it's Alcyon, which is in our system. So, and that's the, called the Great Central Sun. So there might, might be energy uh, emitted from there. But I do agree with perhaps solar flares and coronal mass ejections. That's sending out protons and energy towards us every time that happens whether it's dispersed or a direct hit. So it, it could be, could well be a combination of all of them. I don't know, but I know this. Our next guest is waiting in the wings <laughs> to say hello. So how nice about segue. we bring him uh, <laughs> Well, I say let's bring him on. I'd love to bring on Mark, Dr. Dream Peepler. And I'm sure maybe he has some um, ideas about what's going on right now, and I'd love to yeah. hear him talk about what he's going to be doing at the conference as well. So, Dr. Dream, are you here with us? Hi, Helene. Hi, Greg. How are you? Hey, brother. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. It is, uh, I mean, we're, we're on the countdown. Seven days, 16 hours, 29 minutes, and five, four, three. <laughs> That's awesome. Love it. I know. Love it. Oh, we're going to have a good time. And we had a great time at the Return to Atlantis conference. I have to tell you, Dr. Dream, you are so fun. And uh, I just remember swimming in the ocean with you and running around <laughs> in the ocean. Or I do, I mean, you know, I remember even our ride up to Ventura. You're just generally so much fun. And I'm just really looking forward to the galactivation that um, you're going to be doing at this conference. I know the one in Atlantis was amazing, too. What is, what yeah. is this galactivation going to be like? I, before I go into that, I just have to, to say that, um, you know, these these events, I mean, the, the event that you guys did um, in Florida was over the top, and, and all aspects of it, just, just how everything was put together and the location, and then just, you know, under all of that kind of surface stuff, you know, which means so much, then there's like that big energetic, and it's just like, oh, my gosh, so... Here we are preparing for uh, for next week, and so much excitement, 
Um, this is for the Galactivation experience. Um, this is the year of the rose frequency, and I, I laugh when I say that because it, it may very well be the decade or the century of the rose frequency, but mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll just start out with this year. We've been doing, I've been doing Galactivations as that, as a Galactivation experience since the beginning of 2010. I believe this uh, weekend at City of Angels Cosmic, Cosmic Awakening is going to be our 187th in 105 cities around the world in the last, um, it's about 48 months. And so it's been incredibly powerful. And we just introduced, um, it, it's been the a, a titled A Universal Love Galactivation. And now it's um, a new Galactivation experience, the Rose Frequency. And the reason that um, I'm so drawn to the rose frequency is my extensive work with essential oils, knowing that the frequency of pure rose auto essential oil is one of the highest frequencies that have been tested um, by a particular device uh, back in the 80s by uh, John Hopkins University. And it's, it's the rose frequency, and it comes in like so much, so far expansive and beyond any other essential oil or anything like that. And so um, w we've been working so much with roses that, that I just decided let's just step it up and have, let's just bring people into what we know is established as one of the highest frequencies available naturally. So the experience in Los Angeles, and I'm thrilled to be doing this in Los Angeles. This is our backyard. And because of your energies and everything that, that that you two are about and your emphasis on, you know, really creating community. I mean, you know, it, it's going to have undertones of, of bringing that 5D community together. And so it's, it's about um, attracting these energies and what it means to be, you know, at that, at that peak level for us right now. And uh, it will be, you know, it's a, if you haven't experienced the Galactivation, it's a multiple modality journey into universal love, into a higher frequency. And so, I mean, if you meditate five hours a day or if you wouldn't know a yoga mat if you tripped over one, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Wherever you are in your personal development evolution, the Galactivation is there to allow you the opportunity to, to step it up a level or several levels. And I say the opportunity because it's just like life. It's there. The opportunity's there. Now it's up to you. You know, I can't take the opportunity for a person and move them into that energy, but um, we so beautifully and readily and lovingly offer up the opportunity for people to step into this. You know, it's funny. I, I, I'm seeing the symbolism right now. You're talking about this is the year of the rose, and the rose is so symbolic of today's times where you have – the thorn, which could be represented as the powers that were, along with the beauty of the rose, which is where we're heading, the rose is about to bloom. Mm. Yeah. There is, I mean, there, there, I take pictures every single day, uh, just about. I was in Seattle this week, and I didn't get any rose pictures, but this morning I posted three pictures um, of, of roses that I take um, on my gratitude walk with my dog Jake each morning. And each rose to me, as I take the photo, tells me a story. And I refer to it as the rose metaphor. And so um, recently, and I, I just love, Greg, that you brought this up. Um, recently, I took a picture of a really, really beautiful rose. And the, the core of the rose, the center of the rose, was spiraling in on itself, but in the shape of a heart. And, oh, wow. And what? What I realized when I captured the photo, because I do a lot of close-up work, is in, in a past life, you know, in this lifetime, I was a professional photographer. So, but this is all just with my Android phone. Um, I noticed when I got back uh, to the office and was ready to post it that there were some really dominant, big, solid-looking thorns at the edge of the photo next to this very soft, beautiful rose. Now, what mm -hmm. I what I got from that that day was that the once we get past the protective thorns, 
were allowed into the swirling core of love. And then I went on to say, much like the human experience when we choose to connect with each other, getting past the shell, the armor, the protective coating of, you know, mm. all the hurts and, and letdowns and challenges of our, of our past, because isn't that what we're doing? We're just kind of processing and getting over everything. And I saw that rose photo as I was ready to post it. I'm like, that's it right there. So I love that you brought it up with a little different metaphor attached to it, but that's what I love about <laughs> The roses and everything is, you know, my study of them, because that's what it's become. I mean, intense appreciation is maybe a better word than study. It sounded so, like, intense and work-like when I said study. But so intense appreciation um, really is about all the the differences and just how, how there's divine perfection in every rose, the same way there's divine perfection in every human and in every aspect mm -hmm. of the experience. Because if we don't see it and connect with it, when we're looking at one side of the coin, at one aspect of the experience, we just have to flip it over and look at the other side. There's always at least two sides of a perspective, and one, one of them is going to make you feel better. Gosh, this is such an intense conversation. It's actually brilliant, and I love – I love your work with the rose frequencies, and I remember um, having a session a while ago. Oh, gosh, this was quite some time ago, maybe uh, over a year. Time time really flies, I guess, maybe. <laughs> you used these rose oils on me in a session between you and Laura, and um, I really felt it. You were putting them on my feet and on my hands, and uh, my whole body was shaking. It's just a very high vibrational oil. I mean, what does it actually do for people? Well, for me, well, I mean, I don't know. It was amazing. The the rose is um the, all right. So here's how it works. <clears throat> oils fall into different frequencies. We've we've spoken about that. And essential oils start at about 50 megahertz in frequency and go up to rose oil, which is around the 320. Um, the essential oils that are in the higher frequency work on the emotional body. And the, the essential oils that are in the lower frequency, I'll give you an example, um, peppermint oil I use all the time. Um, peppermint oil comes in at 75 on the scale, which is considered a lower frequency. So it works on the, the physical body. So I carry a lot of my stress in my gut. And so all I have to do is breathe that or, um, the peppermint oil in, and it immediately relaxes that stress center for me. That's a physical um, response. When I work with the uh, rose oil, it's, it's you, you feel it. It's an emotional response. I've had people on the table, as soon as they come into contact with it, start crying. It can create a release. I have a, just a quick little story. I, I, we introduced the Rose Frequency Galactivation at um, the Star Knowledge Conference on 11.11 in Palm Springs, and I'd been working with the Rose Hydrosol and the Rose Auto Oil for a few days prior to my presentation, and I got up to do my presentation on how to hold a high frequency and everything, and the very first picture, you've seen the picture, it's, it's uh, Laura and myself and the boys and Maya and Jake and myself, and, you know, so the whole family, I look at it, I, I always lead my presentation with this, I look at it at this conference, I start crying. I mean, and I think, okay, people are kind of used to Dr. Dream having an open heart, and occasionally he might shed a tear in a, in a presentation, you know, if he's really touched by something. I couldn't stop. I couldn't continue talking. And I had to stand there with, with tears running down my face and explaining that I think I overdid it on the rose oil. <laughs> and then I've been around a lot of rose oil, and I love this picture, but I never have had such an emotional response. And I moved through it, and just to let you know how the whole thing ended, the, the, pres the presentation was great. And afterwards, two men came up to me and said, I want to thank you for that, and thank you for allowing your emotions to show because it gives me permission to do that. And so I thought, okay, so that's why it happened. It worked out. But, but it really works on the emotional body. It can take you out of, like, a downward spiral or a mind loop that is, like, where does this end? And it can just snap you right out of it. Oh, but Dr. Dream, I know as we, as we uh, get ready to close and stuff like this, I just want to say, you know, it was interesting. We chose L.A. to do this event. And it seems like there's a lot of stuff going on there. I mean, that's where Hollywood is. That's where a lot of these other kinds of forces are. And uh, also at the same time, I noticed that some of the highest vibrational 
most spiritual people, uh, people that have complete sets of codes, people that are fully activated and activating, activators, star seeds, way showers, light workers, light warriors, all kinds of folks, they're in the LA area. I think it's like a call for people to actually come together in the physical. You know, do you notice that too? That 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 even despite the um, some of the darker parts about LA, how, do you notice the same thing that there are some of the highest vibrational people out there and some of the highest vibrational activities? Yeah, I mean, there's that thing, and and we we all know it. Like energy attracts. California has always been a bit of a hotbed for. Um, forward thinking and kind of out of the box and, you know, being a little kooky, you know, quite actually um, in the past. But um, now as we, you know, leave the old paradigm behind and and people understand that, you know, maybe there was a little more to that than um, just, you know, people being off tangent. But, you know, quite honestly, I found it everywhere. I mean, I lived in New York City for for, for years, and, and a huge awakening happened for me there, and it's even easier now than ever, but this event in Los Angeles, I believe, is of incredible importance, and if you're listening to this, and you haven't made a decision on whether you want to go or not, you know, take a look at the website. Uh, Helene has already said that there are, there are some sponsorships available, or partial sponsorships available. Really look into it, because now more than ever, I mean, we do so much online and we're all connected and there's the, you know, the, the, all the radio shows and this, that, and the other thing. But, but for us to get together and be face-to-face and to be in one room creating a grid together is this is, this is where the, 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 the intense power play comes in for, for these aspects of the collective that are stepping up to this, and, and I say stepping up because it's not just like, oh, haphazard or anything like that. I mean, people need to be making a conscious choice, a conscious decision right now to step up to what it means to be a part of the awake and conscious and aware collective. And if you're part of that, I'm going to see you in Los Angeles at the City of Angels cosmic awakening conference and if i don't see you there i'm going to know that you've got 10 people at your house in kansas city or omaha or or new york city for the live stream and you're sharing this and bringing your community together this is the time and this is why we're doing these events and so i'm just putting it out there if you're feeling drawn if these words are touching you below the surface you need to be there and step into this and from what I understand, every opportunity is being given to um, to people that want to be there um, to, to make it happen. And, and I honor you both so much. It is, I know that it is not easy putting events on. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be quite honest, we just had to um, cancel an event that, that we were planning in Joshua Tree for March. We may be planning it later in the year, but it's it's not easy. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of times it's a bit on the um, the thankless side. So from, from me, um, and I think I speak for all the other speakers and, and the people that are, are being drawn to this, we thank you so much for doing this. And, um, you know, you really are making a difference, and thanks for including all of us. Oh, we so love you so much, Dr. Dream, and I cannot wait to see you. I can't wait to see you in a week. That's when it's coming. I know. It's so just one. It is. It's right around the corner. It's seven short days. We all get to be together. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm really thrilled about it. And, um, you know, by the way, it was 84 degrees in Ventura today. So <laughs> I know there's last minute great airfares from all over the East Coast where it's much colder. Oh, yeah. It's a nice time oh, to be yeah. in Los Angeles. <laughs> First of all, I'm freezing and I live in Florida. I am freezing mm-hmm. and I'm wearing a sweatshirt and a sweater and socks and sweatpants today. It's something like six. It is sixty-three degrees, and that was at the middle of the day. So, oh my goodness! Helene, you're getting no sympathy from the people up in New York and Minnesota and Wisconsin. Oh, I know. It was like sixty-three. Oh my gosh, Helene! Break up the south coast. I'm still. So I just I want to I want to. Put one more thing out there. Um, as we do at, at all the conferences, um, Laura and I are offering uh, Dream Team Sessions, and people can go to dreamteamsessions.com. 
uh, for more information and touroflove.com for what we're doing. And it links to our sites and our radio show. We're now up to three radio shows a week, uh, Monday through Wednesday at 6 o'clock Pacific time. And you can find that at awakeinthedreamradio.com. Beautiful. Awesome. So, Dr. Dream, thank you again, and we'll see you there. Thank now, you. Again. Love you guys, and have fun with some of my more favorite people that you're going to have on in the next little yes, bit. Yes, <laughs> we've got some great guests. I just want to tell, before we, we we bring Barbara Lamb on, our next guest, I want to invite our listeners to take a look at our website, in 5 d Um or if you'd like to be sponsored, for a ticket, write me and Greg at in 5 D I N number five letter D events eleven at gmail dot com. Yes, yes, yes. So we're getting ready to bring on our next guest, and that is Barbara Lamb. And Barbara Lamb is uh, a ufologist and a crop circle expert. And she recently uh, got the Lifetime Achievement Award as well. So I am so, so excited to bring her on. Barbara, are you there? I am here, yes. Woo-hoo. Oh, yay. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. I'm, I'm glad you can hear me. I was just happily listening to Dr. Dream. Anyway, hello to all of you. And we really are looking forward to this wonderful event. Next oh. weekend, the City of Angels Cosmic Awakening Conference. It's just great. And I'm going to be speaking on um, extraterrestrials, uh, positive, benevolent, loving, and spiritual extraterrestrials. And this comes from my 23 years of work, um, therapeutic and regression work with well, at least 1,000 individuals now who've had extraterrestrial encounters. And in the regression work, we go back to an event that they want to know more about because people usually don't consciously remember too much about these experiences, usually just the beginning or the end. But in the regression, it's wonderful because the person is actually reliving that event moment by moment by moment so that they end up knowing what happened and there are usually a number of different features that happen a tremendous variety of of features from person to person and then they can work with it they can assimilate it they can relate to it in their conscious life and that is very therapeutically helpful so not only Is that really helpful to the person, which is the main point of my doing this? But what we learn from this about these other beings is absolutely fascinating. And I have concluded now, after 23 years of doing so much of this work in my therapy practice, that there are quite a number of beings, the ones that I have encountered or helped other people to encounter, I'd say there are at least 40 different types, maybe more, of these extraterrestrial beings that come to Earth and have visits for an hour or two um, with certain individuals. Uh, So one person uh, can have a whole variety of experiences. On some occasions, maybe the encounter, or some people call it an abduction, or some people call it a contact. Nevertheless, whatever the event is, sometimes people experience that in a more negative way. It it may be frightening uh, until they really learn more about it. And then on other occasions, it might seem like there's a whole educational component, and they feel rather positive and sort of neutral about that sort of event. And then many of these people have extremely positive, inspiring events with some of these beings. 
and they feel often like they're taken beyond the veil, that is the way some people express it, into highly spiritual, glorious experiences. And so often these people express feeling unconditional love by those kinds of beings. And yet they've been taken from their home or their car or wherever the experience started. So they may worry at first, like, oh, what's going to happen? And yet in many of these encounters, they feel so unconditionally loved and it's so inspiring that they really hate to come back here to earth and go on with their regular everyday life because nothing that they've experienced here can even begin to equal that kind of experience with those beings that we would still consider extraterrestrial. So in my talk, I'm going to, which is Sunday, uh, the 26th, uh, Sunday at 10.30 in the morning till noon, I'm going to be showing a lot of illustrations of these beings. And these are illustrations that for the most part have been rendered uh, by a forensic artist who takes a description from one of these experiencers and gets a very detailed description and keeps drawing it or painting it until the experiencer says, yes, that's exactly what that being looked like. So we're very fortunate to have uh, people who can do that kind of artistic rendering. And then also, I have three photographs which I will show that I think, truly, honestly, are genuine photos of real extraterrestrial beings. So oh, wow. it's going to be really interesting. And I have uh, beautiful artist renditions of some of the highly spiritual, inspiring beings that many people encounter, encounter including myself. So um, it's, it's a varied program, and it really gives a wide swatch and quite a bit of understanding, I think, about the whole extraterrestrial phenomenon. And there'll be time for questions. And as Elaine mentioned, I'm also a long-term crop circle researcher, also since 1991, um, going to England every summer to personally visit, experience, investigate as many crop circles as I can when I'm over there for a month each summer. And I, this lecture is not going to be really focused particularly on that, but I'd be very happy to make uh, some comments about how these wonderful beings, which we consider out in space or frequently in another dimension, uh, how they seem to be involved in the making of these crop circles. It seems to be one of the major ways that they're trying to communicate with humanity in a very positive way, a way that doesn't ever harm anybody or scare anybody. And it's it's a phenomenon that is there to see it remains for two or three or four months every year, uh, a different set of crop circles every summer. And people can go from all over the world and visit these wonderful formations and experience the energies in them, the increase of energies, and very often uh, feel very inspired. Um, you find person after person sitting down in a crop circle and lying down often, and meditating. Uh, some of us have out-of-body experiences uh, when we're in a crop circle, when we settle down and really relax. And some people get channeled messages while sitting in a crop circle. And, and then there's the investigative part about it, too, really going around and looking at the laid-down plants, looking for certain features, 
like smooth bends where the stalks have been bent over just above ground level um, or expanded what we call swollen growth nodes and dwarf seed heads, uh, just to name a few of the biophysical changes that can happen in these plants. And so we do sort of a, a visual scientific exploration, and then we allow ourselves to have our own personal experience. So I, having been in, oh, at least 11 or 1,200 crop circles over these years, I very often, in some of them anyway, feel a real sense of presence, that there is some benevolent intelligence and it seems like looking down at me and beaming, beaming with pleasure that here is a person or anybody else in the crop circle who is honoring this, is interested in this, is being affected by these crop circles in a very positive way. So I will relate that to some extent in my lecture to the benevolent extraterrestrial beings. And I think it's really important to bring out this aspect of the extraterrestrial phenomenon, uh, not only for the sake of itself, it's true, it's wonderful to know about, but also because um, there's been so much negative publicity, I call it booga booga, about the negative aliens, uh, the bad ones, as some people describe them. Who are the good ones? Who are the bad ones? I ha hear people saying, well, I don't know that there are any bad extraterrestrials. I rather doubt that. But for sure, there are some extraterrestrial beings whom people really do not like to have encounters with. They seem more robotic or more um, stiff, more unemotional, more unexpressive, more uncaring, some of them. And they do medical examinations and uh, take physical samples of this and that from people in many cases, not all. Uh, they also do reproductive programs, creating hybrid beings. And there's a very positive aspect to that whole program that I really like to bring out with great high honoring. Um, but then some of those very same people who experience that sort of thing on some occasions, that they on other occasions, or the second half of that occasion, they are taken in with some beings who are so enlightened and loving and caring and spiritually oriented um, that the whole experience turns out to be extremely uplifting and positive for them. So I like to get past the judgment about extraterrestrial beings, about aliens, as they're so often called, unfortunately, in our media and, and our movies and some of the television presentations really go for the fear. They go for the negativity. And let's face it, that's what sells a lot here on planet Earth with humanity. Not to me, but it does to many people, obviously. So I think it's only fair to bring out the other aspect of this whole phenomenon, which is so positive, so inspiring, so loving, and gives us the type of experiences that we're honored to have, we're delighted to have. So it's my privilege, definitely, I, I just love it, um, to be given the opportunity to speak about these things. I have no doubt about the reality of these encounters, and I think it's really healthy and good the more that this sort of thing can come out into people's awareness. So do you have any questions at this point? I'm loaded um, with them. 
<laughs> Actually, a, a quick comment. You were talking about the experiencer's feeling of unconditional love, and I've heard the same thing about people that have had near-death experiences. I remember seeing this one woman who was married, had children on this side. She has this near-death experience, crosses over to the other side, and there's so much unconditional love there that she didn't want to come back to her husband and children, and she loved them dearly. Oh, yes, <laughs> so, absolutely. You're right. I've heard yeah. that many times testimonies and it's it's the same sort of thing you see there are other forms of life in this dimension that we live in um 5d dimension as uh helen uh, helene is so aware of and um and many other dimensions too so i think when people leave the physical body in a near-death experience you know they have that opportunity to be with those glowing, enlightened, wonderful beings. And a lovely thing is that you don't even have to die temporarily to do that, uh, to be in touch with these very loving beings. Um, You can just do that by having an extraterrestrial encounter. Now this raises the question, can we ask for and receive an extraterrestrial encounter if we're not one of those millions of people worldwide who are having these experiences anyway. And I say, yes, we can. We can ask for this and receive it if, and it's a very important if, if we really, really mean it if we want to take our chances on what kind of a being would come for us or a set of beings, um, we can ask. And I think, in my experience and others I know, sooner or later, or maybe even on that occasion, um, the person will have their own visit. And sometimes, of course, that begins with a UFO sighting, and especially if the UFO sighting is a rather close one. It's not just like a little tiny dot up in the sky, although sometimes those are crafts and they come much closer. But I think anyone who has had a close encounter that is a sighting of a UFO within oh, say 500 feet or 1,000 feet, that's pretty close considering all of space, Um, that they are very likely to have already had on that occasion an extraterrestrial full-on encounter whether they remember it or not. So I've regressed many people who say, you know, I had a very close sighting and this big light came toward me and my car and filled the car and surrounded the car. I didn't know what was happening. The car motor started to slow down and then it sort of spluttered to a stop. And then I was aware that in this bright light that people, well, actually beings, took me from the car, even if all the car doors were locked. And uh, took me on board what turned out to be a craft and into a very vivid experience. Um, But people can ask. I had an experience of that sort of thing in 1994 when I was in England. And I had been told by an extraterrestrial that if I wanted to, I could be taken for the making of a crop circle. And I had to think about that for about six months. I mean, there's a part of me that's very adventurous, but uh, there's a part of me that pulls back once in a while and says, well, I don't know really what I'm getting into here, so I'm not sure I want to do that. But I sort of worked up to it for six months, and then I did what I had been told to do, by the being who gave this information, and that was that I talked out loud to the extraterrestrial beings. I didn't know who they were 
or what they look like, but I just talked to them. I said, those who make the crop circles, please hear me. And I praised them and honored their work that was done, complimented them, and saying, I really am so interested in this crop circle phenomenon, and I'm so interested in you who have anything to do with the making of these crop circles. I would really like to be taken for the making of one. That was in 1994, in August. And when I was there in England that very month, there was one night when, just as I was turning out the light in the room of the inn I was staying in, I could see three unusual-looking beings, just the silhouettes, coming toward me from the nightlight that was shining in the window behind them. That's why they were silhouettes. And I thought, oh, boy, maybe this is it. And then before I knew it, before they got to me, I was out of consciousness and didn't know anything until I woke up in the morning with the alarm clock. And oh, then, my God. It's like yeah. and then Barbara. That, yeah. <laughs> that day, I have to. I, first of all, I just want to say this, too, because we have so many guests on this show back-to-back. Barbara, I have to schedule an interview with you, and we have to go through each of these stories. I didn't even, I've didn't even, i even interviewed you before, and that didn't even come up. And, oh, no, oh my so much God. Up. Yeah. You're like fascinating speaker. I I just want to say, please keep your eyes open. You are going to see more of Barbara Lamb on Sovereign Media. She's sharing <laughs> so many incredible things. Like I said, I've spoken to you, and still, um, yeah, I just oh, I I tell you, so you're much fascinating, more. so well, much there's... more. And and Barbara, I still I have a bunch this. of questions. <laughs> Oh, I know, Rick, but well, but we come have... to the conference and ask me there. I'd be happy. Happy uh, to see you. Okay. Gr- yeah, Chris very happy. Chris will be at this conference as, as our co-host. We put this together. Yep. And oh, we good. Pick the, we picked the right people because, Barbara, like I say, your stories, it's just mind-blowing. And uh, the fact that you have these pictures for people to see also. Um, yes. I mean, it's an incredible. I could see why you won the Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, and you. I know, I know. And um, like I said, you keep your eyes open because you just might see Barbara Lamb come around again. That's for sure. I want to thank you so much for coming to our conference and being part of it. We love oh, you, Barbara, and thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. Welcome, and I think it's wonderful that you're putting on this conference. Oh, we'll wonderful. see you in a week from now. <laughs> Absolutely. Good. Thank Yay. you. So Take much. care, Barbara. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Oh. Bye. Gosh, great. That was fascinating. Wow. And I and I hated I, I hated to cut it short, but we also have so many <laughs> guests and I wanted to share again with our listeners that they can register to come to this conference by going to in 5 devents.com and if you feel called to attend this conference for whatever reason don't have the funds but know that you are meant to be there write us at in 5 devents 11 at gmail.com now Greg we have somebody fabulous waiting in the wings to speak to us you just interviewed her the other day, and it was an amazing interview. So, Nora, are you there with us right now? I'm here. Can you both hear me? All right. Yay. Yay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it, was, Outstanding. it was a great interview. <laughs> it was a really good interview with Nora. What a show. I listened to that oh, twice thank you. since then. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Nora, you brought in at that show, you brought in the Pleiadians. You brought in Caliandra. You brought in Yeshua. I think that that was it, but the things that and we the were talking about. And the oh, unicorns. Oh, that's right, the unicorn. <laughs> CJ's that was so, unicorns. Yeah, that was so sweet. It was CJ's daughter, uh, CJ. Well, you know what uh, was Miller. fascinating? What was fascinating for me about that unicorn piece was, as they were talking about, as Caliandra was, or the Pleiadians, I can't remember who said it, were, were talking about 
clear out the visual images that you have associated with the unicorn and instead link up with the unicorn energy with your heart. I started to do that myself as I was channeling. So sometimes I'm able to both channel and run a process in the same moment. And I suddenly accessed, I guess what you'd call the vibration or the frequency of the unicorn in a way that I hadn't been able to before, in a way that I hadn't really tried to before. I, I'd never really gone out searching for the unicorns, not in that way. Um, but that that's how I work. You know, somebody will ask a question or or trigger a, a subject matter, and suddenly I find myself exploring new vibrations and new frequencies and new realms and dimensions, and that's one of the reasons why I channel so many of the different beings and collectives that I do. It's to facilitate the experience of those who are asking, those who are coming, those who are attending. So for all of you that are planning on attending the event, you know, know that you'll come in with your own particular set of questions and issues and contracts, and much of that will be answered and spoken to and addressed before you open your mouths. Many of you will find you don't have to ask your questions because the beings that I work with and the beings that you're coming in with will have that information all cataloged and transmitted to me without you having to act as an as an in-between there uh, by asking your questions. Let me ask you this. <laughs> Speaking of asking <laughs> questions... How often do you make a personal decision in your life, and then all of a sudden one of the different beings or collectives tells you, uh, don't do that, and you're thinking, but I want to do this or something. Does that ever happen, or how often does it happen? You know, that that happens occasionally now. It happened much more often earlier on. As, as I was still fragmented in my own beingness, so there was third-dimensional Nora, the ego of Nora making decisions, and then there was an aura, my higher self, that would suddenly butt in and give information. Then there were all the guides and beings that I'm connecting with that at times would say, no, no, not that way. But what I often find, Greg, is that kind of interference, and I see that almost as interference, only occurs if it's absolutely necessary because the point of our journey here is to become sovereign. So what I learned to do over time was slow down my decision-making process and consciously ask for guidance. Because it's kind of like, you know, in Star Trek, the prime directive, they're not going to interfere unless it is absolutely karmically necessary. They are always there to offer their assistance, unconditional love, guidance, and those messages are always coming through. But they're not going to amp their volume unless, the individual earthling in the moment is about to step out of their own contracted experience. All right, so mm. what I'm doing right now, what I'm, I'll just explain what I'm doing right now. So some of that was Nora speaking, but some of that was also channeled information in the moment. I was just choosing to remain as Nora and operate as a channel as, and, and operate as a translator for the Pleiadians. So I wasn't direct voice channeling as I will in the event, but I was... I was being a translator there because Nora didn't actually have the answer to the question you just asked. So that was me. Mm. Right. Can we, can we, maybe, can you share with our audience just briefly, who are the Pleiadians, this, this sure. team of people working with you? Sure. So the Pleiadians are a collective of light beings that align their vibration and frequency on multiple dimensions. I have worked both with the Ninth Dimensional Pleiadian Collective and a Twelfth Dimensional Pleiadian Collective. There is a different vibration and energy to each collective, as there's a different vibration and energy to each one of us and every experience we have. So interacting with different beings and different vibrations allows for a bigger experience. It allows the listener to access different kinds of perspectives on the same information or the same answer to a question, just like if you were going to ask five people to answer a question for you. So the Pleiadians themselves, uh, greetings, this is the Pleiadian Collective. As always, it is wonderful to have the opportunity to link up with all of you beautiful universal beings of light and love. So 
what happened there is Nora just kindly asked for us to come through directly and talk about who we are as opposed to having her explain who we are. And we often find that to really understand who we are or who any of the other beings are, you have to have a direct experience with the energy itself. So it's one thing to hear about the Pleiadians, it's another to fully experience our energy and our presence. And for those of you who are listening right now, to be able to listen to this transmission through Nora means you have to be opening up as a channel yourself. You cannot listen to channeled information without opening your heart center and accessing those higher dimensional abilities yourself. So all of you right now are operating as channels. And all of you who attend the event will operate as channels as well. And what occurs during our contact with all of you is, yes, certainly a transmission of a tremendous amount of verbal information. But what's underneath that is an energetic transmission that you take in directly into your physical bodies, into your energetic bodies, that will then continue to work within your bodies for weeks and months to come. Now, as some of you are listening to this, we can feel you asking the question of what the purpose of that transmission is. So our work with all of you is to help you remember your identities as love incarnate, to help you integrate what we're all calling right now collectively your fifth dimensional identity, vibration, frequency, or your higher self. And we use those terms interchangeably. And we'll say this as well. We give a version of reality. We give a story. We don't give the story, the big story, because from our perspective, there is not one being or one collective out there that has all the answers to everything. And there are so many different timelines, realities, and then so many different beings, meaning all of you, who are all creating your moments, your timelines, your versions of reality. There are as many versions of reality as there are beings to interpret reality. So we give our version. Our suggestion always is to take what resonates with you and re leave the rest behind. So that will happen within you physically and energetically as well. Your DNA and your energetic bodies, so your third dimensional and your fifth dimensional bodies, will take in the energetic pieces that resonate with you in this moment, that align with you, that light you up, and you'll use that information to alter your own physical bodies and your energetic presence here on the planet. And then you'll step back into your day-to-day -day lives and you'll bring that new version of yourself into your day-to-day -day life. So the, we work in a very grounded, practical, and day-to-day -day way with all of you. We like to offer processes and help and information that lets you have the most fulfilling and powerful experience you can have on Earth right now at this time. The why, the, because there's that question there, why? Why are we working with you? Well, we are part of the collective, meaning the many, many beings, star systems that participated in seeding life on Earth. So many of you on the planet carry genetic information from the Pleiades star system. Many of you hear that word, the Pleiades, or the seven sisters as were referred to on your planet, and that triggers something in your memory banks. Many of you already know that you're Pleiadian in origin, or at least partly Pleiadian in origin, because you are all a mix of many different races and species. So we are and were your architects. We are entwined with you in this way, and we are ready to advance to our next, designation in this universe so our help 
here that we're offering you uh, helps us as well because as you evolve, integrate, transform, shift, remember you are sovereign, you impact the universal matrix, you help to recreate this universe, and we benefit from that as well. So it is a reciprocal relationship that we're having with all of you, where as we transmit and you receive, you also transmit and we receive as well. And we do this because we are family. Wow. Now, I would like to ask Nora and then hear the channeled response. I've often wondered, and those who know me know that I ask questions that nobody else will ask. What happens when you're having intimate times with your boyfriend (laughs) <laughs> Are the questions standing around watching, or do you have to tell them to get lost for an hour or something? O M G, Greg. <laughs> no, no, I think it's a, it's a it's a great question. I've been asked the que- I asked the question when I started channeling. I was like, "Are you in the bathroom with me?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't perceive our reality the way we perceive it, so they don't see naked bodies. They don't see uh, bodily fluids. <laughs> they don't see it. They see us as light and frequency and vibration. They see us from their perspective. They also don't have any judgments about our reality. You know, we're very judgmental here in the third dimension as we live in this very dualistic and polarized kind of reality. Uh, This is the Pleiadian, so we'll jump in as well. So what we hear you saying is that you have a wish for privacy, all of you. That's one of the gifts of a third dimensional experience that you get to take on the illusion that you are separate from source, separate from one another. You can close your bedroom door and do whatever you want and nobody else can know. And that's a lot of fun for all of you. But as you integrate and reascend and alter your frequencies and vibrations, you're going to have to release that need for privacy, for hiding. Because in a fifth dimensional experience, you are telepathic. You are sharing information with one another all the time. And we would say that this is one of the biggest issues in your reascension process right now. So many of you are holding feelings of shame about beliefs you have, things you have done, feelings you have, things you've engaged in. So it's time for all of you to really send transmissions of unconditional love to any version of yourself that is holding shame and is wanting to isolate itself, fragment itself off from the whole being experience. And as you do that, as you send that transmission of unconditional love to the shadowy aspects of yourself, then you come into a state of wholeness, suddenly you realize really, truly, that you are a love incarnate, that there is no right or wrong that you are all the same. And as you do that, then you are able collectively to come together along with Earth itself in tandem. You get to work then to shift into that 5D experience in a visceral and physical way. Okay, that was a big answer to it. What You know, that's so funny, right, because that's sometimes the way it will happen, that a question will come from that place of levity and lightheartedness and They'll just come back with <laughs> really big information. Yeah, but that was a really good answer because oh, it yeah. brought attention to, you know, our 3D realities and um, our belief that maybe we're separate from everything, but we really are connected. And it's a very interesting thing as we're doing this event that we are we are working to create 5D communities and We're doing it in this event by helping people become aware of their connection with their ET families. So, golly gee, you're the perfect, perfect speaker to be part of this conference. And I'm so glad you're going to be with us on January 5th. I'm really excited. I'm really excited to be there, Helene. You know, and as I was listening to Barbara, I was reflecting on my own personal experiences I've had Uh, with physical ET contact because I'm a contactee as well. So I'm a channel, I'm a Reiki master, I'm a healer, and I'm also an experiencer and a contactee. And 
And I haven't fully accessed my abduction memories, but I probably um, could put myself in that category as well. I know there's there are things back there I haven't fully let myself remember yet, although I know from this point that they weren't really abductions. That's kind of what Barbara was getting into there. They were prearranged, agreed-upon experiences before incarnation to facilitate the greater good of those ET races who need our help. Mm. Well, Nora, I'm so glad that you were able to come on to our show tonight, the preview of the uh, City of Angels Cosmic Awakening Conference, which is taking place a week from today. I Woo-hoo! thank you so much, so, so much. Woohoo! Woohoo! That was woo-hoo. awesome. Thank you. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, and thank it's you so being- wonderful to connect with you as well, Greg. I'm really looking forward to meeting you. I've met the beautiful Helene already, so I'm looking forward to getting oh, to we you. Had, so we had a lot <laughs> of fun. Thank you, Nora. I want to I wanna just tell people, for if you're interested in connecting with Nora, you can find her at noraherald.com. I want to also say that if you're interested in coming to this conference or learning more about it, some of the details of the conference, check out in5devent.com. If you're interested in coming to the conference and maybe you're short of funds or whatever the reason is, um, we are happy to sponsor you. If you feel that you belong there with us, you are so welcome. And so drop us a line at in5devent11 at gmail.com and let us know you're interested in attending, whatever the reason. And there is space for you at this conference. We love you. So I just wanted to say that too. And Greg, before um, before we bring on our next guest, which is Daryl Anka, I want to give a shout out to our friends at Sovereign Media that are allowing us to um, to have this program. So I want to say thank you so much to Larry Bazell. I also want to say thank you so much to Kevin, our producer, that uh, here behind the scenes making things happen and I want to wish his girlfriend Sandy a very very happy birthday so with that I think we're ready to say hello to our next guest Daryl Anka Daryl are you on the line I am can you hear me I sure can yes. hi guys hey brother hi thank you How so you? much for coming on we can't wait to see you next weekend oh my pleasure i can't wait to be there i think it'll be a lot of fun <laughs> i know it will i Definitely. know it will oh my goodness daryl i've had a couple of interviews with you every time i speak to you i'm just uh you know you open my eyes to so many different concepts and new things oh. well thank you at this at this conference i know that you're going to be channeling bashar um, yeah. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about who Bashar is. Well, as <clears throat> far as we can tell, he has presented himself as an extraterrestrial consciousness, and the channeling is the result of a telepathic connection between us that began many, many years ago after two actual physical broad daylight sightings of his UFO here over Los Angeles. So he is basically working to deliver information of a cosmic nature with a perspective that allows people to understand the workings of creation, how to apply the ideas, the the laws, the conditions of existence to their daily lives to make the kind of positive, constructive changes that uh, they would prefer to. So he's good at delivering shall we say, toolkits to people uh, to allow them to understand how to be self-empowered and to make the connections or um, remember the connections that they already have to creation. Well, Daryl, first of all, uh, thank you for being here with us. And also, I want to thank you for popping in on In5D, the live chat at the bottom of uh, every page on In5D.com. There's a live chat. And uh, Daryl actually has popped in there on occasion. I want to thank you for doing that. Um, Let me ask you this. Did you ever ask Bashar why he chose you to be the conduit instead of whoever, you know? Well, it it didn't really – it wasn't really necessary because he had already explained that from a linear perspective – 
uh, I am one of his past lives, and he is one of my future mm. lives. So in, in essence, we are the same soul in two different time frames, and therefore it's really just an agreement that was made within that one soul to have two different lives that would deliver this information through in this way. So what is your understanding mm. of time with that understanding of what, what, you, what you just explained? Well, from his perspective and what I'm learning day by day is that time is really kind of an illusion. It's our projection. It's our way of experiencing the concept of change and discovery and growth. But it is just our projection, and everything really exists all at once. And therefore, because Bashar exists now and I exist now, that connection can be made. Well, it's interesting you, you mentioned that because I, I once had a dream where and I was talking about this when Helene and I had the uh, New Year's Eve manifestation uh, radio show. I had a dream where I was I, I was I set myself back from 27 years into the future because critical mass wasn't high enough at this mm-hmm. point in time. So I set myself back from 27 years into the future, and I, all I remember saying, telling somebody was that I was a master copy of myself. <laughs> I thought that was pretty <laughs> profound, if nothing else. Let me ask you this. What have you learned about through Bashar uh, about our H-negative people? Are they from another star system or a group of star systems? Well, I don't know that they're from another star system, but I think that might be at least partially an indication that people from other star systems have had a hand in affecting or altering our genetic makeup. And so it might be an indicator of that alteration that happened a long time ago. And therefore, there might be an ability because of the frequency of that genetic material to allow people to connect a little bit more strongly, vibrationally speaking, uh, to other realities, to other civilizations that are representative of that frequency. Does that make sense? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm, that's really interesting. You know, if you, you know, Daryl, Greg, and I were talking about this uh, before the show with this RH negative thing, and I actually have a son that is uh, uh, RH negative. It was almost like my body was. Re- I am O positive. My body was actually mm-hmm. kind of rejecting uh, that energy. So this was like part of a bigger conversation. So it's very interesting to hear your take on it. I actually, I want to switch gears a minute, and I want to actually. Sure. Talk about this strong feeling that I've had lately, and and actually Greg shares uh, in creating community. This feel like a, a push um, to bring people together in the physical. I, we met a lot of people, like-minded people, on Facebook and in other avenues, even online forums that are all around the world, and we had felt so driven to create these kind of spaces where people can come together. I guess I'd love your input on where that is coming from. Is that from something bigger? Is that a download? Is it just... I believe that a lot of us are here now on the earth because we know this is a great time of transformation, that it is the perfect timing for us to go through a change and, and shift into a reality that is certainly more representative and more reflective of our true nature, our higher self, our greater being. And so I think that we have, many of us have simply chosen to gravitate to those kinds of energies at this time. I know there certainly were times when most people that are exploring the expansion of consciousness felt like they were the only ones, that they were here on the earth alone. I'm I'm sure you must have had some of that kind of a feeling at some point in your life. But as we begin to explore these ideas and expand our consciousness, we find out that there is an attractive nature, a magnetic nature to that energy. And I think that bit by bit, we find that other people of like mind, of like vibration, are gravitating together, are coming together, and that that's an indication that we kind of knew that that community creation with a new mindset would be a reflection of a new world that we are creating together or shifting to together that's far more representative of what we believe we prefer to experience the physical reality to be. So I I think it's basically a product of, of an agreement made on another level that's playing out now in physical reality 
and that all the members that have decided to dip into that vibration are kind of finding each other and coming together magnetically to demonstrate that there are many, many like-minded people who are ready for a change. Mm. Yeah, a great time of transformation is what you said a second ago. I just want to hear what your take is on what is going on right now. Well, you know, as Bashar has explained sometimes, the idea really is that <clears throat> you can't really experience discovery from a timeless dimension. You have to have the idea of forgetting who you are in a space-time reality in order to have the experience of rediscovering who you are. But when you rediscover who you are, you're doing it from a new perspective. And therefore, the idea of transformation is the actual mechanism or process of creation by which you can actually experience yourself from a new point of view and expand the understanding and idea of who and what you are as an aspect of all that is of creation. So I think this time of transformation is going on not only on an individual level for people to discover more of who they are as individual souls, but also we're seeing a great collective surge um, and a, the sort of the leading edge of a wave of energy that I think is indicative of the fact that we are re-identifying ourselves even as a society, as a world, and coming into a kind of adulthood or a maturity and beginning to become the kind of world that can take its place among the cosmic neighborhood, so to speak, where we're, we're earning our place in, in the cosmic club, I think. <laughs> nice. Let me ask you this, Daryl. What's with the positioning of your hands when you channel Bashar? Because I've been positioning my hands like that for as long as I can remember. Well, it's not something I ever did intentionally. It's, it's actually a result of the energy coming through my body and whatever Bashar is doing at the other end to sort of um, regulate that energy. And as far as I understand it, it's probably similar to what people have described when they see people meditating or going into different altered states. My understanding of it, and it may be far more than this, but my understanding of it is that it is in some way regulating the energy coming through me, balancing the energy coming through me in a manner that makes it a little bit easier for me to handle the energy. Um, so I think it's kind of like being in a, it's, it's almost like a focusing mechanism in a way almost like you're you're holding a lens because normally my hands are right over my solar plexus and that is as Bashar has explained at the chakra of intention and so anytime there's an intent uh the energy is kind of amplifying in that area and i think by holding my hands in a triangular formation in that area or over that area it's able to regulate and and process and allow that energy to flow through and out to the audience uh, and give them a certain frequency or vibration uh, that acts kind of like a, um, uh, for lack of a better term, I guess a beacon uh, of of his frequency that then gives them an opportunity to match that frequency uh, and align more with the reality that he's describing to them. Yeah, you know, and I was also wondering too, I asked Nora Harold about this. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you heard this question. <laughs> no, no. But uh, okay, well, you know, say say you're having uh, some intimate time with your girlfriend. Does he ever pop in on you and say, no. <laughs> no, or no, do you no. ever have to say, hey, you know, give me give me a little free time here? No, uh, the you know, the time for them is not what it is for us, and they have a much broader perspective. Uh -huh of the timing that is appropriate for when the connections are made. And, and those kinds of surprises don't happen. But the closest that something like that will happen will simply be that if, if I need information downloaded or delivered to me, then it will just simply pop into my head as information. He will never in any way, shape, or form force himself to, quote, unquote, take over my energy. That simply doesn't serve the purpose that he's here to perform. Mm -hmm. Now, can so, you channel him with your eyes open? It has happened very briefly a couple of times, and it may be something that changes in time. But for me, my technique, the way that I simply learned to do it, was to have my eyes closed because for me, uh, the input coming into my eyes is a distraction. 
and it wouldn't allow me to allow the connection to happen as strongly uh, as it does if I'm also having visual input. Because I also get visual input on a different level when I'm doing the channeling. I see imagery uh, of things he's describing or abstract symbology that's representative of concepts he may be talking about. And if my eyes are open, then in a sense it would sort of compete with the inner imagery that I'm getting that is representative of the direct telepathic link of the energy flowing through me. So it's just easier for me. It's just more comfortable for me to keep my eyes closed. Okay. You know, I I actually have a little question. I wanted to know, I know I once had an interview with you, and I was asking what Bashar shared with you about our future. But, you know, a lot of the times I'm realizing that all timelines are fluid. And mm-hmm. so that we don't have a, a one definite future. No. So does Bashar show you some of the possibilities? Yeah, any time that Bashar talks about the idea of the future, what he's actually saying is there's a great deal of energy behind this probability, therefore it is likely to be the one that manifests, but something could change that. And he usually gives us the sense that it it seems likely that it will change or unlikely that it will change. So he's really just dealing in probabilities based on the fact that he sees that there is a number of potential avenues we could go down. What's the biggest effect on changing the probability of a timeline? Well, ironically, one of the biggest effects is actually making the prediction. In other words, he's basically saying there's no such thing as a prediction of the future. There is a sensing of the energy that exists at the moment the prediction is made, and if that energy doesn't change, then it will come to pass. It will manifest. But the very fact that someone may be sensing that energy and telling someone that this is where the energy is could actually change the energy because now you know about it. So if for some reason what you're told is something that you don't prefer, now that you're aware that that's a high probability, you can actually change the degree of energy that you have focused in that direction and actually manifest something else. So the prediction itself of the future can actually render the future obsolete. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like like quantum physics, you know, mm-hmm. you have, you're turning actually like a particle to a wave and then an observer has to see it for yeah. that do turn into a wave, I guess. That, I don't, I don't yeah, know I, I mean, that, basically, right? yeah, basically you get the result that you designed the experiment for. So whatever energy changes in you, whatever frequency you're operating on, however your perspective is, is going to determine what you're going to experience. And that's really his deepest message is stay in the state you prefer and then that's going to manifest whatever is going to be most representative of that preferred state, regardless of how it looks. You don't even always necessarily have to know it, how it will come out. It's just that you will know that what will come out will be representative of that state, and therefore it will be representative of what you prefer, even if you can't imagine what that would be right now. So that's why it's really important right now for those people listening, <laughs> shut off the TV because that's creating the reality. That's creating <laughs> timelines right there through fear. It can be, although, again, you don't have to react to it that way. Anything can serve double duty. So you can learn things from anything you see on television in a positive way if you want to give it a positive spin for yourself, uh, regardless of whether you watch it or not. It's really up to the person to decide what's the best methodology for them. Some people will find it better that they don't watch that. Other people will find that it will help them by looking at what they're being presented with as a representation of what they don't prefer, and maybe by seeing a representation of what they don't prefer, it will clarify for them what they do prefer. So it just depends on how you use the information more than the information itself. You know, it's interesting, too. I had an interview with you. I don't know, maybe my first interview with you and. 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, you said fear is your friend. It's yeah, because you it's look. yeah, it's telling <laughs> it's telling you that there is some belief within you that's out of alignment with your true self. See, we only have one energy, each of us, and that energy gets filtered through belief systems, and the belief systems determine what we experience our physical reality to be, what we think is most likely true. If you filter your energy through positive belief systems that are in alignment with your true self, you will experience that energy as joy. If you 
take the same energy and filter it through belief systems that are negative and out of alignment with your true self, you will experience the same energy in the vibration we call fear. So fear is like someone knocking on your door and saying, hey, you've got a belief system you're unaware of that's out of alignment with who you prefer to be. So I'm letting you know, I'm bringing it to your attention consciously that you have this belief so that now you made the belief conscious, now you can deal with it, now you can change it. So if you say thank you to fear for enlightening you to the fact about something inside your consciousness you didn't know about, then fear will have done its job by bringing your attention to it, and as soon as you acknowledge that, it will go away. It will turn into joy because it's done its job and you've allowed it to do its job. The only reason fear sticks around is because we ignore it and we're afraid to see what it has to say. But the only thing fear ever has to say in my experience is that it turns you on to a piece of yourself you're unaware of that you need to know about in order to actually bring it into alignment with your joy. So, Daryl, like once you feel the fear, what is your method for processing this fear so that you can let it go? Well, Bashar has presented a number of methods, but the simplest one is to simply ask the question, what would I have to believe is true about myself in relation to the situation in order to experience this feeling this way? Because as he's explained it, you can't have an emotional feeling of any kind until you actually have a belief or a definition first. So the definition and the belief generates the emotion. So if you experience fear, that means that there is a belief that's out of alignment. So the question would be, what would I have to believe is true in order to have this fear? And once you ask the question, if you're willing to hear the answer, something in your life, be it an inspiration or synchronicity or some other method, will give you the answer as to what that definition is. And once it becomes conscious, you'll be able to deal with it. And any definition, any belief that is out of alignment with your true self will always, once it's identified consciously, will always be seen to be illogical and nonsensical, and you'll realize that that definition came from someone else. And it has nothing to do with you. It probably came from your parents, your friends, your society, work, play, school. But you'll realize that you bought into it. And you'll realize as the moment you identify it that it makes no sense for who you prefer to be. And as soon as you realize it makes no sense, you'll drop it. Now, speaking of Bashar, can you tell the listeners a little about what you'll be talking about at the City of Angels Cosmic Awakening Conference next weekend? Well, since it is titled Cosmic Awakening, I'm sure that basically Bashar will talk a little bit about what that means from his perspective. But I think in order to help facilitate people in their personal cosmic awakening, he will probably open the majority of the two-hour session to questions and answers so that people can ask him specifically what they would like to work on in their own lives. And he'll reflect to them uh, his perspectives of the best ways to go about um, making the kind of changes that they would like to make to become more of who they are, or at least remember more of who they are, and uh, that way to, in a practical sense, take these tools that he's sharing with us and apply them in their physical reality and thus then make it easier for them to have their own cosmic awakening. I think that's pretty much what he will do. Well, there you have it, folks. Get your questions ready for Bashar next weekend. Yeah, and you can also... If you're not around um, the L.A. area, you can always tune in on live stream. And information about live stream is on in5devents.com. So that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, it's interesting, Daryl. You know what I noticed about some of the shows uh, that I see uh, where Bashar is channeling? That even if somebody doesn't, get their questions answered it almost seems like or they didn't get their question directly answered you seem to channel information that's extremely relevant to everybody in the audience you notice yeah, how that happens yes Bashar has a way of of answering a lot of questions that people are thinking about that they don't necessarily have an opportunity to actually ask him physically so he works very holographically that way, and a lot of people find their questions get answered even just by sitting in the audience and listening to what he's saying to some other person. So from the perspective of Bashar, like when you're actually doing the show 
and your eyes are closed and different people are coming up to the mic to ask you questions, what do you see? Do you see the energy or the energy signature of each person coming um, in? Yeah, Bashar perceives people as patterns of energy. Uh, some of the energy relates to the idea of different moments in their lives, different ideas, different belief systems and perspectives. Some of it relates to their higher self. Some of it relates to other lives they may be connected to. Uh, it just depends on what the subject is that's being discussed. And I can see some of those patterns in my mind's eye when he's describing them or perceiving them. I will get abstract images that are sometimes representative of the concepts that he may be discussing. I'll get feelings, energies flowing through me. It's like being lost in a very energetic, very dynamic daydream. Uh, I don't always understand. I don't hear the words per se, and, and I don't understand exactly what he may be saying to someone. But I'm getting concepts downloaded into me that are passing through me in the way that I need them even at the same time that my brain may be translating the telepathic message into language that the person talking to him needs to hear. Hmm. Interesting. I'm getting so excited. I can't wait to see you. I cannot wait to hear you do this. It's going to be such a treat. And I'm just so glad that you're coming to do this for this. Well, event. I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys making a space for these kinds of things to be done because that's, what allows the connections to be made. So thank you for the work that you do. Aww. And thank you for appearing on our, our show, too. Our oh, yeah. Again, well, Darryl, it's, it's, an, it's a conduit. We're, Indeed. We're, uh, yes. Well, we're winding it up. Do you have a closing message for any of our listeners today? I think just basically the most important message is the idea of really understanding that when you hear people talk about, you know, acting on your bliss, following your passion – that there are real reasons, real physical reasons, energetic reasons for doing that. And that's one of the things I think Bashar explains most strongly that I'm sure he'll cover at the event next weekend is why is that so important and how does that work? What is it about acting on your excitement that allows the manifestations to appear in your life that are really, really representative of your dreams? Um, I, I think it's the the encouragement for people to act on their dreams is really what Bashar gives people and explains why that works. And, and I think that's what people need to understand is, is that is a real reality and not just uh, a nice sounding statement. Absolutely. I love that close message. So folks can take a look at your website, which is Bashar.org. If they have any questions about what you do and who you are and what your upcoming events are as well, yes? Yes. And you have another, when is your movie coming? When is that going to be released? Yes, well, we have, an, yeah, my production company is Zia Films, and we've already done one movie about the afterlife, and we're right in the middle of doing a documentary now on Bashar. Uh, the film itself will probably be done sometime late in the spring, and then we'll enter it into film festivals and see if we can't get distribution for it into the theaters. So there's no way to know exactly at the moment when it will reach the public, but we are uh, definitely right smack in the middle of doing that documentary, explaining how I became a channel, what channeling is, demystifying the process, and talking about who Bashar is and what his messages are all about. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing it, and thank you so much again for coming on. We'll Thanks, see guys. you next weekend. <laughs> you will. Yay. Thank you, brother. So, All right. Take you. care, guys. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Take care now. So, Bye-bye. This was an awesome show, Greg. I had a ball. I had a ball talking to five out of six of our guests. So I just want to recap again. Um, at the, the City of Angels Cosmic Awakening Conference, we're having six amazing speakers, George Norrie, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower, who you heard today on this show, Mark, Dr. Dream Peebler, you've heard Barbara Lamb, you heard Nora Harold, and Daryl Anka. All five of those uh, speakers on this radio show today will be at the conference. And um, more information, again, is at in5devents.com. We're having this at the LAX Holiday Inn. And um, after Bashar is done speaking on Saturday evening, we're having a Soul Family Reunion Happy Hour Party at the LAX Holiday Inn. We'd love it 
if you come and see us. We want to meet you. We want to connect with our soul family, and um, we're just so excited about it. Greg, do you have anything you know, to I'm add? Not- yeah, definitely. You know, everybody, and I can tell you this from the Return to Atlantis conference, everybody that's here is totally approachable. You can go up and talk to them as if you've known them for all your life. And I get that a lot on in 5D radio. A lot of people will tell me that, you know, it's just, you know, your voice, it sounds like, you know, I've, I've known you and I, I feel really comfortable with you, you know, and that's just the way we all are. I mean, we're very approachable people. And uh, so if you have any questions for anybody, you know, just come on up and ask. I it's know. going to be a great time. Soul families are getting together. Definitely looking forward to this. And you got plenty of time to still make arrangements and make it out there to Los Angeles next weekend. Absolutely. I want to give one final shout out to vendors who are interested. The space is still available. And um, if you are interested in being a vendor, Either contact me, Helene Lipson, on Facebook, send me a message, or you can write me at in5devents11 at gmail.com. And I can answer any questions that you may have about vending at this event. So um, I just want to say I can't wait to see you all there. I, I cannot wait. I'm already packing. And uh, I'm almost <laughs> done, and it's a week away. That's how excited I am. I know. So, <laughs> so I say say thank you to everybody that was tuned in tonight. We had an amazing show, Greg. This was a lot of fun. Indeed. Yeah, it went by way too quickly. I still have a kajillion questions, and hopefully, I'll be able to ask one or two out, out at the conference. Oh, we'll have time. We'll have time for lots of questions, and we're going to learn a lot uh-huh. about each of these speakers. So again. In5DEvents.com is where to find out more about the conference. Special thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. Special thanks to our friends on Sovereign Media for hosting this event to um, talk about uh, our event, on in, our In5D event. Um, we appreciate the, uh, the partnership and the camaraderie and I love working together with Sovereign Media and in 5D. It's beautiful. Anyway, I guess it's time to say goodnight, Greg. It is. And to everyone, looking forward to seeing you out there. Namaste to all. Namaste. Good night.